Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. You can find our old shows there, subscribe by RSS, iTunes, etc. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter, where actually I've been kind of active recently, been mentioning some things, and we have a lot of upcoming events. So uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Brock Palin, all one word. And again, I have Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of Open MPI. And Jeff, you just got back from another MPI forum meeting, so I assume the next revision of MPI is cooking along. It's coming. There's a, there's a boff at Supercomputing about MPI 3.0. We're looking to be done with MPI 3.0 by next Supercomputing. And that is, date is tentative, um, but that's, that's the goal we're shooting for. And there's a bunch of interesting things coming in there. And the biggest fight right now is about C++, which is <laughs> really interesting and I feel responsible for because I created the C++ bindings back in 1996. Um, but yes, anyway, the inner machinations of the MPI forum. But come to the, uh, the BOF at Supercomputing and hear all about that. And speaking of BOFs, I have my own BOF as well with George Basilica from the University of Tennessee about the State of the Union for Open MPI. And, and thankfully, the uh, supercomputing organizers did not put us opposite the, uh, the MPI CH BOF. Um, this year, last year they did. It was kind of disappointing because so you couldn't go to both. And I like to hear what those guys have to say too. So I think they're on Monday and we're on Tuesday, or they're on Tuesday and we're on Wednesday, or something, something, something like that. Yeah, and I'll also be at SC. I'll be floating around. I'm not doing any speaking at SC, but I'll be there the entire week. Also, I have coming up at, uh, at my home institution, University of Michigan, right here in Ann Arbor, we have a Cyber Infrastructure Days coming up, just a couple of days, the 29th through the 1st, uh, November and December. Uh, and I'll actually be speaking there on Exceed, which is the follow-on to TerraGrid with Phil Blood from Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. Cool. Uh, I'll also be giving some other tutorials on compiler tips and stuff like that for the average researcher so yeah i saw you you advertised something about you did some mpi tutorial or something uh, recently. A, a very very basic one is this the one i asked if 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 you wanted to come and do but it's, it's very basic because <laughs> then i found out they only gave me an, a 90 minutes to do it in like r really really yeah okay. yeah uh, not not i couldn't justify the travel for 90 minutes <laughs> for 90 minutes yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah i'll be i'll be speaking on that too and the uh, other other random stuff focused towards people okay. who are actually getting their hands dirty. So, hey, well, and one throwback to, to supercomputing too. We got to we feel like we need to mention the student cluster competition because that was just so awesome last year that we were a part of it, and uh, the energy and the excitement around that. You need to go stop by and see all the students. I think they're on the floor this year or right adjacent. I'm not sure exactly where they are, but you need to go see them and talk to them because it was really really very cool last year. Yeah, no, that was that was a great thing last year, and I think you know Doug and those guys have been putting a lot of neat stuff together with teams and stuff this year. So I'm excited to see what actually I need I need to look up what the challenges are this year, what the applications are. I'm curious. All right, I'll throw out one last thing too. Also, my blog and uh, my Twitter on there. Brock's been more active on Twitter than I have recently, but I've been answering a bunch of uh, MPI related questions on my blog recently. So if you have any questions about how MPI works or why we do the things the way we do or anything about the forum or the standard, please feel free to let me know, either an email or Twitter, and uh, I'll write up a blog post about it. So with that, I think our, our pre-show extravaganza is done, Brock. You want to introduce our, our guest for today? <laughs> yes. Yes. Our, our guest today comes from DreamHost. Uh, his name is Sage uh, Weil, and he's actually the... the I believe he actually started the Ceph uh, Distributed File System project. So, Sage, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Yeah, my name is Sage Weil. Um, <clears throat> I did my graduate work at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where um, my thesis was on the distributed storage. Um, and out of that grew the, the Ceph Distributed File System. Um, and since finishing, I've sort of continued working on that project to make it a viable open source solution to the scalability and reliability issues that people have for HPC type, HPC type storage um, and enterprise for that matter. So Seth basically built out of this work you did before, there wasn't encouragement from somebody else or is this something you fully decided on your own you were going to go do? It, it, it grew out of um, the tri-labs, the Sedendia, Livermore and Los Alamos, um, a series of grants they made um, to Santa Cruz to look at scalable petascale object-based storage system. Um, and so there was some initial research there um, dealing with uh, low-level object file systems and placement algorithms. 
Um, but when I joined the project, uh, I was focusing on distributed metadata and sort of how to deal with that issue. At the time, um, Livermore in particular was just starting to use Lustre, um, and they were having a lot of pain with the uh, lack of scalability in the metadata server, and so that was sort of a key motivation for that work. Um, but sort of out of that whole, I know I started with metadata, but as a result, we sort of ended up building the rest of the system, um, including a scalable, reliable object storage layer um, and uh, improved placement policy and so forth. So what exactly is object storage as, as, composed, as compared to, say, you know, quote-unquote normal storage? Um, I think traditional systems typically talk about storage in terms of blocks. So you'd have like um, either on a single disk, it's block number, some large number, um, or in a, I guess, a SAN file system, you'd talk about block offsets within a LUN or something like that. Um, in contrast, the idea with object-based storage is that um, you you name, in the same way that you name a block by numbering it, you would name the object, but it isn't necessarily a number, and it doesn't have a fixed size. So the object can be small or large, and you can have some metadata associated with it as well. And it, it, essentially, the, the, the sort of the key idea is that um, while traditionally file systems are um, have to pay attention to data layout and placement and block allocation and you know which sectors on the disk are storing what data, um, using an object-based interface lets you push all of that complexity into the lowest levels of the system where it's more or less hidden and all the distributed, clustered, whatever, the higher levels of the file system don't really have to worry about those details and it simplifies things greatly. So does that mean Ceph, as much as it's a, a file system and a, a driver to be able to write and read and write to it, does it actually live on top of like something else that actually deals with the actual 4K blocks going on disk? Exactly, yeah. So um, normally we, we put our Ceph, um, OSDs we call them, although it has nothing to do with this SCSI T10 OSDs. So it's a sort of poor choice of name. Um, but the, basically the Ceph storage servers um, that manage the, the objects sit on top of a, normally a Butterfest file system. And then that man, where they actually show up is just files. And so the sort of the low-level file system on each of those nodes handles all those details. Um, you can also run it on XFS or ext 4 or whatever else, but that's the that's the basic idea. Um, and then Ceph itself only has to worry about you know what's in the objects and where in the cluster are they located. I mean, it doesn't have to care about rewriting a B tree implementation to track free space or whatever. No, you threw out a bunch of alphabet soup there. Can you uh, decrypt <laughs> some of those things there? So you said things like T10 and, and whatnot. What, what are some of these things for people who aren't familiar with uh, file systems and whatnot? Um, well, I, I hesitate a little bit to talk about T10 because it's sort of a, a red herring. But essentially, there is, a, there is a push maybe five or ten years ago to have this idea of an object disk that basically encapsulates, encapsulates this idea of pushing the details of block allocation into the device. And the original vision was that you would actually buy a hard drive that you would store objects on. And the, the protocol, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say store this block, this data in this stick size block, but you'd actually name the objects and so forth. Um, that, there's a spec that came out of that, um, and it never really took off. Um, and so now when people talk about OSDs or object disks, usually that's what they think about, but in reality they don't actually exist <laughs> in the real world uh, for the most part. There are some people that sort of approximate that specification in their products, but Nobody actually sells devices. Um, so in contrast to that, Ceph is something completely different. So it basically, it, the idea is that you just take the, the basic idea of pushing the details of block allocation into the storage nodes um, and the lowest sort of layers of the system as possible. Um, and then you can sort of focus on the hard problems of making it scale and distribute it and make it reliable and so forth. So I think you already kind of answered this question a little bit, but let's get it explicitly. There's already a couple of uh, free license parallel file systems out there, you know, Lustre, PVFS2. Oh, why go in the complete direction of building a completely new implementation rather than just putting, contributing distributed metadata to Lustre? Um, the real, I think the real difference is that um, the systems aren't really designed with fault tolerance in mind. Um, whereas, sort of when we were at the drawing board with Ceph, um, this, we sort of realized that in order to build something that's going to scale to um, hundreds or thousands of nodes or more, that you really have to design for failure from the, from the beginning. Um, and those systems tend to be constructed on um, the idea that your, your storage nodes are reliable in some way. So they rely on you know, a SAN backend and failover and dual paths and so forth, which means that you have to have expensive hardware. And our hope is that you can run, you can 
do the hard work of dealing with failure in software, and then you can run on commodity hardware um, for, I guess, more cloudy type environments. Um, I mean, the, the real thing is that when we when we started the drawing board, sort of designing the architecture, the goal was to avoid any sort of um, points of scalability uh, limitations and future scalability, and so. It's, it's not clear exactly where the scalability wall is going to be. It really depends on your hardware and so forth, but we try not to design any into the system. Um, and so we've been able to test on hundreds of nodes, um, not thousands yet because it's hard to get access to those kinds of clusters. We can only really simulate sort of the workloads that we would expect in those environments. Um, but the goal is that, you know, scale as big as you can build it. So does that mean I don't have to worry about, so like on Luster, I, I, each of my OSTs, I'm you know, making a RAID 5 or something like that to deal with hard drive failure. With Ceph, can I just throw every disk into Ceph and... It, Precisely. It, and Precisely. It'll deal with it? So okay. if, if you want to, you can run RAID underneath each of the, the file systems that have a particular OSD on them. I mean, that just means that that individual node will be more reliable than it would otherwise be. And so when you do the math to figure out your mean time to data failure or whatever, then um, it'll be better. But you don't have to. So Ceph will replicate every object in the system across multiple object storage devices or demons, targets, whatever you want to call them. Um, and so you, in general, don't have to worry about node failure. Interesting. So you really are going after commodity hardware, like you said before. So even uh, crappy low-end disks, it won't matter, hypothetically, because you've got replication. So if a disk fails or even a whole node fails, it, it's not too much of a tragedy. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. And that's, yeah. The, I mean, the, the problem is that even at scale, even if you have the best hardware, once you start throwing thousands of separate devices into the mix, something is always going to fail. You know, failure is a, a given. It's just a question of when, not whether. Um, and so you have to deal with it in one way or another. Um, so you can run stuff on high-end hardware, and it'll just be super reliable. And if you run it on low-end hardware, and the math will just work out a little bit differently, and it'll be more probable that you'll lose. You'll have the double or triple failures that'll cause cause data loss. Um, but really, the, there really is no single point of failure in the system. I think we've already been seeing this in other types where your, you can almost say your layer above where you normally would have your redundancy needs to handle your reliability failures because, you know, dual power supplies, RAID, all these things only last so long. You look at something like Hadoop's HDFS, which serves mm -hmm. a very specific purpose. It replicates, doesn't use RAID, you know, just does all these things. Right. So, so why did you choose replication? Why not do some sort of parity calculation and, you know, just... Does it not actually save you any space or performance, or why do you go that route? Um, replication is simple, and we want to make it work first. Um, and also, the the cost of disk space is ever plummeting, and so um, at some level, it's not worth it. At least, not yet, <laughs> from our perspective. So then, do you do any type of intelligence? Say, I have two Ceph clients request the same file. Can I? use the closest replica or how does, does do you do any performance benefit from doing replication there is there is some logic like that um, in the system right now but it's not currently enabled um, and we added that specifically for the Hadoop type workloads where the whole goal is to run the computation on the node that has the data and so you want that that locality calculation um, but in general it actually isn't necessarily a win in fact it rarely is to read from multiple rec replicas of data because it means that your caches don't perform as well so let me ask a, what might be a, a, a ignorant question for a, a non-file system guy. Um, does Ceph embody a file system in itself, or is there an upper layer file system that uh, that understands your object store? Uh, it's it's kind of all things at once. So at the at the lowest level of the system, um, the basic abstraction is a reliable, distributed, and scalable object storage system. Um, and so you have these series of demons across a bunch of nodes. Um, serving up their local disks, and it gives you a nice, clean abstraction that lets you, when you store an object, you know it's replicated, it's reliable, it's going to move around as as nodes are added to the system or um, failures happen or so forth, and that's all managed for you. And so basic object storage is the lowest level interface. We also have a um, something called Rados block device, which is a block device that's essentially just striped over objects, and that gives you um, a simple, reliable, shared storage for um, block devices. And then on top of that, we add a clustered metadata server um, on top of the object um, layer, I should say. We have a clustered metadata server that gives you a POSIX namespace, and that gives you sort of the, the scalable distributed file system. 
um, that HPC people typically care about. Um, yeah. So are there other ways to access Ceph or do you pretty much, is, is Radios pretty much the Ceph file system driver, you could say? Um, well, you can access it in those three ways. So you can talk directly to the Rados object storage layer um, using the native APIs. So you can talk to the block device that's striped on top of those, or you can talk to the POSIX file system. Um, there is actually one other component called, uh, we call it the Rados gateway, that gives you a RESTful object storage proxy that speaks um, like an S3 compatible or Swift compatible sort of RESTful object storage interface. Um, and that talks directly to the object store to, to serve up objects as well. S3 so, being the Amazon storage? Right. Right, so you, 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 you're basically saying that you can emulate what the Amazon storage APIs look like. Right, or the Swift APIs, which is what, um, I guess, Rackspace, OpenStack are using. So can you actually use all of those at the same time? Could I have a big Ceph you know, pile of disk and Ceph on top of it, access yes. from my cluster with MPI on one, and have some mm -hmm. S3 clients and other things? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So the, the Rados object storage layer um, lets you separate objects into pools. Each pool sort of has a, a set level of replication and sort of whatever the current placement policy is. Um, but you have multiple pools with independent sets of objects. Um, and so you might be have one of them that's full of block devices, one that's used for the file system, one that's used for, you know, whatever else. All right, well, Brock just mentioned my favorite word there, MPI. So I have to ask, are there, is there any thought of having an MPI-specific driver for parallel I.O. with Ceph? Um, I haven't been involved in anything MPI for some time now, um, so um, I don't know actually what that would entail, um, but presumably um, you could write an MPI I.O. driver um, that takes advantage of something in Ceph that gives you more than just having a local mount would. I'm not exactly sure though, what, what that would be, honestly, but... Okay, fair enough. Um, are, is there any relationship between Ceph and, and some of the other parallel file systems out there, like NFS 4.1 or, or something like that? Um, not really. I mean, I think there's a, at a high level, there's sort of some architectural similarities um, between uh, you know, Ceph, Luster, um, and sort of the PNFS 4 idea where you have separate metadata management for the namespace versus and direct client access to data. Um, but the similarity kind of ends there. Um, and we've actually looked at PNFS several times, and people have asked why we don't use PNFS for the metadata protocol. And the answer really is that a lot of the, the smart things that the Ceph metadata server is doing to make it scale properly and deal with HPC-type workloads where you have you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of clients accessing the same file or directory and so forth, um, you can't really do within the confines of the PNFS metadata protocol. And so we have our, we have our own protocol that... You know, we wrote our own Linux kernel driver and pushed that into the mainline kernel so that you can sort of take advantage of the, the full capabilities of the system. So early on, and I've been lurking on the mailing list for a while, it looked like the underlying file system of choice is ButterFS. What was the choice with going ButterFS rather than ext4 or some other file system? Well, originally we actually wrote our own file system um, in user space. It was called eBoss. Um, and it was, you know, a, the idea being that if you're dealing just with sort of this object workload, then you don't need a lot of the complexity um, in the file system, dealing with hierarchies and the namespace hierarchy and so forth. Um, but as, as things progressed, we found that we were essentially reinventing the wheel. You know, we're re-implementing B-trees and we're doing copy on write and we're adding checksumming and all this stuff to manage the underlying devices. And all of that work is really being done in the file system space as well. Um, and when the Butterfest project started, it sort of had the best best of breed, I guess, all the, all the things that we really wanted, right? It has um, pervasive checksumming throughout the system. It has a, a very generalized um, and efficient B-tree, copy and write B-tree infrastructure that the whole file system is based on that gives you great metadata locality. And um, it handles multiple devices. It'll do replication across you know, different parts of the same disk or across multiple disks. Um, eventually, it's going to have read codes in there. It's going to have... Um, allow you to take advantage of SSDs to, you know, manage the placement, um, you know, make metadata performance faster, all that stuff within the file system. And we really just didn't want to maintain our own low-level file system when ButterFS was doing all the things that we wanted out of the system. Um, and so we sort of chose that route. Um, we could have used ext4 or XFS or something like that. And in fact, you can run Ceph on top of those systems. Um, the, the key thing is that uh, Ceph 
includes support for snapshots. Um, and in order to make those efficient, we hook into the low level sort of butterfest copy and write capabilities so that we don't actually copy data. Um, whereas with those other systems, um, you actually do have to literally copy objects when they're snapshotted and then modified. Um, and so they're less efficient for that reason. Okay, I guess that actually answers part of my next question, which was, does it help you much to have special functionality in the underlying file system? So you're using those hooks for the uh, snapshotting capability. Is mm -hmm. there anything else that you would like to see maybe ButterFS or a different file system add that would help Ceph out? Um, the other thing that we use in ButterFS is we hook into ButterFS's snapshotting mechanism to make um, sort of consistent point-in-time snapshots of the low-level file system. And that helps the, um, the Ceph OSD's storage nodes um, keep sort of their data fully consistent on disk so that when they restart and do the recovery, they don't have to do a lot of validation and checking. Um, and it's hard to sort of graft those features onto other file systems that already exist. Um, and so we, we struggle with that. We, we would really like to be able to run Ceph on top of um, any backend file system. Um, but it's a challenge to sort of get the minimum set of, um, I guess, features in those systems that let us sort of have that basic functionality um, without changing the architecture and you know losing this the stability that they offer. Um, you know, XT3 is a or XT4 is extremely mature file system because it's been um, largely unchanged and used for so long, um, and so it's hard to sort of <laughs> add new things to it without breaking that. So uh, a little bit of a tangent here. At the beginning of the show, you talked about uh, wanting to go into the enterprise as well. Um, for that, you would probably need uh, either OS X and or Windows clients. Are those kinds of things in the works? Um, sort of indirectly. So the, I mentioned that there's a, a, an upstream Linux kernel client for the file system. There's also a user space implementation of that that we call the CephFS. Um, and there are a couple of projects that um, link that user space library into other products. So there's one that glues that to the Samba, which is the open source SIFS server for Linux that everybody uses. Um, it glues it into Samba's internal file system abstraction. And so you can run a Samba server that talks directly to the Ceph cluster and re-export Ceph as SIFS. Um, and there's a similar project to do the same with um, NFS Ganesha which is sort of a promising user land implementation of an NFS server um, that will eventually also support things like GNFS, I believe. Um, and so those sort of give you the interoperability um, with existing standard protocols that, that people are looking for. Now, on, a, on an architectural level, though, if you talk to a Samba server, Samba is not distributed. So do you lose some of the benefits of doing stuff that way? Um, some. You, you do have to have gateway nodes that sort of re-export the system um, if you don't have a native client. Uh, on the other hand, recently Samba has um, the support for having an array of, of Samba servers that sort of re-export the same back-end cluster file system um, is improving. Um, and so that, that capability has really sort of grown up of late. And so you can just have, depending on whatever your, your throughput demands are, then you just add however many servers you need to sort of support that load. Um, I mean, you are you are suffering from the. It does become a bottleneck um, in the same way that you know if you're coming from an NFS background, an NFS server is a, a scaling bottleneck because all traffic has to go through it. You have the same problem with uh, the Samba servers. The, the nice thing though is that you can just add n of them right in order to support your load, um, but you don't take full advantage of being able to talk directly to the backend sub storage service that you would with a native protocol. So continuing on this thread of scalability and performance, let's look at two different uh, use cases. I have mm -hmm. an HPC cluster, and I want to write from multiple clients to a single file, a massive quantity of data. How does mm -hmm. Ceph scale that? The other one is I've on one of these new machines with you know, 200,000 cores, and I'm going to do file per process checkpointing. So I'm going to create 200,000 files all at the same time. How does Ceph handle those two different cases? Um, so they're actually handled at completely different levels. In the first case, where you have lots of clients writing to the same file, um, the, basically the file byte sequence is striped over objects, and those objects are randomly distributed across your backend storage nodes. And so because all the different cores are writing to different offsets within the same file, they're actually writing to different objects that are scattered across a cluster, and they're all talking directly to those backend servers in parallel. And so you have sort of 
perfect scaling in that case. So the only trick there is dealing with uh, POSIX consistency issues. So POSIX requires that a write is atomic um, with respect to other writes. So if you have two overlapping writes, one of them happens before the other. And that sort of thing is very difficult to do when you have um, a parallel or distributed file system. And so normally what Ceph will do when you have multiple writers to the same file, it'll switch to a synchronous I.O. mode. And so every write will actually go all the way through the OSDs and then come back and the same thing with reads. Um, that may or may not work um, if you have lots of clients dumping across a large file, depending on whether they're doing lots of small IOs or a few large IOs. Um, but what we do provide is the ability to relax consistency sort of electively for that single file, similar to the OLazy um, POSIX extensions that were suggested um, several years back, um, so that clients can sort of, if they know that they're not going to step on each other's toes, then they can relax consistency for that one file and then take advantage of the buffering and so forth and then um, sort of more, more carefully control how data is written out. Um, and in the other case where you have, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of cores or millions of cores writing to um, separate files, say in the same directory, um, that really becomes a metadata problem where you have all those nodes trying to talk to the server to create a file, and then they write out the data to the OSDs and then having to update the file size and, and in time when they're done. Uh, and in that case, that's really where the distributed metadata cluster comes into play. Um, for a single directory, Ceph has the ability to to detect that uh, it, is, it becomes hot, um, and it'll take that directory namespace and break it into separate fragments, and then distribute those fragments across different metadata servers in the cluster. And so that workload of creating all these files is distributed across all of your available metadata servers. Um, and so you're able to scale it that way. So does Ceph actually have dedicated metadata servers and dedicated storage servers? Yes, yes. So if I want to, say I'm running out of inodes in my file system, but I still have a lot of space, I just stack on another metadata server? Well, you would never run out of inodes because it's a 64-bit inode namespace. Um, so that's, that's probably not going to happen in, in <laughs> the foreseeable um, next several centuries. Um, but yeah, so what, what you would really do is when you notice that your metadata um, performance is slow, then you would add more metadata servers. And then the internal cluster load balancer would notice that um, um, some of the metadata servers are busy and other ones aren't, and it'll sort of shift um, responsibility for the file system namespace across different nodes in order to sort of maximally utilize your available server resources given the current workload. So give us a list of some of the other features that, uh, you know, you have specifically developed for Ceph that people have asked for or originally came out of the, the Trilabs grant or, or things like that that are, that are different. So you, you mentioned replication for one. Um, and you mentioned a couple different ways of scalability. What else? Um, let's see. One that I, I also mentioned was the sort of the POSIX IO o lazy extensions that people suggested. Um, so you can selectively relax consistency on a file if you're an HPC workload and know, the nodes are going to step um, on each other's toes. Um, sort of more stepping back and looking at the overall architecture. Um, one key thing that's a differentiator is the use of the crush placement algorithm. And the idea there is that um, if you're sort of randomly distributing data across this cluster, um, you can't take a naive approach and actually make it completely random because you want to avoid um, correlated failures taking out multiple replicas of the same data. And so Crush lets you sort of describe your, your hardware um, or your, cluster, your storage cluster um, in terms of the physical infrastructure. So you would have a hierarchy that includes knowledge about nodes and then hosts that contain those OSDs or disks and then racks that contain those nodes and so forth. And so you can actually make your data placement policy say something like, I want three replicas of every object, but I want them to be in separate racks so that if a single power circuit goes out or I lose a network switch, I only lose at most one replica of any given object. Um, other things would be um, in the metadata server, um, we have the ability to track recursive metadata. So for every directory, we have both a, uh, we have a recursive size, for example, that's defined as a summation of all file sizes of all files nested beneath that point in the hierarchy. And so if you do an ls-al, for example, by default, that's what's shown for the directory size. And you can see how much data is contained within a part of the directory tree without actually having to do, say, a du. That'll run for hours and give you back the same number. Um, we've added uh, a few things. Um, to support Hadoop workloads, um, like the ability to, in certain circumstances, read from replicas, if it makes sense, um, given the workload. The biggest, the biggest differentiator, I think, is really that, um, in the object storage layer in particular, is that sort of the driving architectural motivation is to push as much intelligence as possible into the storage demons that are running on each individual node um, in order to make the system scale. So 
Um, in contrast to um, other systems that don't need to grow as, as large, um, if there's a failure, for example, there's normally some controller node or something that notices the failure and then tells other nodes to read data off one node and writes it out onto another or sort of manages the migration of data and balancing and so forth. Whereas in Ceph, um, we try to do that on all the individual storage nodes themselves. So we give every node in the system sort of full knowledge of what the current state of the hardware available is and then what the placement algorithm specifies where the data should go. And then all the nodes sort of use peer-to-peer -peer type algorithms to move data to the right locations without, with very little central coordination. And that's sort of the key to making the system um, self-managing, easy to maintain, and you know, scalable anywhere from one node to you know, hundreds or thousands or whatever. So here's the one thing that we run into with really large file systems. What's a FISC of a multi-petabyte Ceph file system look like? That is a good question. Um, I think the key is that you don't want to have to take the system offline in order to do an FS check. Um, and you have to make sure that FS check is implemented in a way that doesn't build up all these in-memory data structures because that simply isn't possible when you're talking about petabytes or exabytes of data. Um, and so what it, I think what it really needs to be is something that... Um, First, that the system is doing um, on its own all the time anyway. So as, as you use the system and you um, traverse the hierarchy, it should be doing validation checks that it can. Um, and then when it comes time to do sort of a, a more um, hardcore uh, consistency check, we have to make sure that the namespace is, isn't linked in some insane way with loops or something like that. And then you minimize the, you minimize the amount of data that you have to sort of track in memory um, so that that's actually efficient, effective and efficient. Um, it's so given the way that the Ceph architecture works, we actually separate the consistency check sort of into two in distinct um, pieces. One is making sure that the object storage layer is consistent. That's the piece that everything is sort of resting on top of. Um, and to do that, um, what we currently do is have each node sort of periodically look at the data, the set of objects that it's currently storing and the metadata associated with them, and then compare that with the replicas that are supposed to exist and make sure that the replicas are actually storing the same thing. And that's a sort of background scrubbing operation that, that we do. Dealing with um, a check on the metadata layer on the metadata server, so the, the file system's deposits namespace, um, is more difficult because you have this, essentially this huge tree structure, and you have to make sure that the graph has no cycles. Um, it's actually you know, sort of a sane, a sane thing. Um, and that's honestly, that's a challenge that we haven't fully, a goal that we haven't fully reached yet. So FS check, we have a number of designs in the works, um, but we don't have a working implementation yet. So actually, that, that's a perfect lead into what, what is the current status of, of Ceph? What's, uh, what's available? What's the current stable version? How many people are using it? These kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, well, we were very ambitious. Um, <laughs> we spent a lot of time sort of implementing all the pieces that you're going to need. Um, you know, you have object storage, you have a block device, you have the metadata server, you have uh, a security system that looks very much like Kerberos so that there's, there's real authentication in the system. Um, uh, and so we sort of bit off a lot to chew. Um, and as a result, not all of those pieces are really ready yet. Um, and so for the most part, you can sort of look at the system as a series of layers. Um, if you look at the low-level object storage layer that gives you this distributed object storage system, um, that is very close to maturity and being um, able to be used in production. And in fact, uh, we'll be launching, DreamHost will be launching a product that's based on that in the very near future. Um, and as you sort of go up the stack, things get progressively less stable. So if you talk about um, the RBD layer, which gives you these block devices, that's also a very simple thing, and it, it works quite well, um, both on the client side and on the, on the server side. Um, and then once you talk about the metadata server, this is a, a huge chunk of code and a lot of complexity because it does so many crazy, exciting things. Um, and so if you use a single metadata server configuration, um, it works quite well. Um, and it's certainly usable. I wouldn't put production data on it just yet, but um, if you're looking to try it out, then it's don't expect it to crash. Um, and then once you start talking about the, the clustering for the metadata servers, um, then that's when you start having to, be, having to be careful. And so our focus these days really is on um, improving our QA infrastructure, um, our automated testing to, to make sure we don't introduce new bugs as we fix old ones, um, and to expand the pool of people who are really testing the whole system. So is there a, that, this is another perfect lead in here. Is there a community surrounding this or is there corporate backing or what, what is the framework that you're doing all this work in? Uh, there's, there's both. So my goal from the outset was to build an open source system that would do all the things that the enterprise systems would do, but cost horrendous amounts of money. Um, and so from the beginning, the system was open source. It's LGPL licensed. Um, uh, I 
spent a lot of time working with the Linux kernel community to get a, a driver upstream so that um, you could use this in mainline Linux and you wouldn't be tied to any proprietary or out of tree stuff. And so, so that there is very much a community there. Um, there's a very active mailing list and IRC channel. Um, people from all over the place have been, been testing it out from the we were from the finance industry to people interested in Hadoop to research groups to um, service providers. Uh, the, the cloud community most recently has been extremely interested, particularly in RBD, um, as people as projects like OpenStack, a sort of open um, cloud environment um, take off. Um, everybody wants to deploy their own private clouds, and there's no real credible open source storage solution for that. And so a lot of people are looking at stuff for that. Um, and so we've been very happy with the sort of the community that's growing around there. Um, and at the same time, we also have sort of a corporate support for the project as well. Um, so my company, DreamHost, um, has been sort of incubating this as a research project for some time. And we're in the process now of creating an actual uh, independent sort of storage company that's focused on supporting this, um, much like Red Hat supports Linux. Um, it's a similar sort of support model so that organizations wishing to deploy this can actually pay somebody to support it for them. They can lean on them when they run into problems um, and ask, ask them for help. Now, with all the work that's being done, are, are you the main guy or, you know, are you recruiting or, you know, how, how it, there's so much to be done. Uh, who does it? Uh, I am recruiting. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I am, I am the main guy. Um, I guess I'm, I guess you'd call me chief architect or something. Um, <laughs> so internally here we have a development team of six, seven, I guess, eight people. We just had a couple of people start. Um, we have a couple of business people who are working on sort of building the organization around that. Um, and then we have contributors from other companies as well. Um, several OEM providers, I guess, I, don't, I guess it wouldn't be OEMs, but they're um, enterprise uh, appliance vendors, I guess, that want to put stuff in their own products and they're sort of invested and a lot of people, I guess, working on cloud products as well. Um, so if someone was, was interested in joining you, would they uh, throw a resume your way or, or is there contact info yes. on your website? Yes. Yeah. So yes, we're, we're, we're aggressively looking for um, experienced developers, uh, both people with experience with storage um, and uh, in the HPC area too, as well. I'm also for you know working on QA. Um, so people interested in the project should um, definitely go to the Ceph homepage at ceph.com or ceph.newgren.net, or they can go to dreamhost.com and look at the jobs page. The jobs are also listed there, um, and we are would be very interested in hearing from them. So, is anybody representing Ceph or Dreamhost going to be at SC? Uh, I will be there. Yeah, I'll be there on Tuesday. There's a, a panel on open source file systems that Galen Shipman organized. Um, I actually can't remember who else is on the panel. I think there's somebody from PDFS, from Cluster, I suspect. I'm not sure who else. Um, so I'll be participating in that. And I'll be there for a couple of days surrounding that as well. Okay, so then what's coming for the future of Ceph? So the short answer is a lot is coming. Um, we're in the process of putting together a real business organization around the project to support it. Um, really turning this from what has been a research project into something that is a real system that people can put deploy in real organizations in real production environments. So that means that we're hiring, um, we're looking for business partners, we're you know, working on supporting the community, um, and we're working on the sort of the product roadmap to really make sure that we're we're offering people what they need to use um, and we can do so as quickly as possible um, for for all use cases, um, be it you know the the developer who wants to get involved, uh, the cloud storage provider who wants to set up their private cloud and run virtual machines, or whether it's you know an HPC environment where they want something that's going to be more efficient and cheaper to maintain to run their ginormous workloads on. Okay, Sage, well, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, you already mentioned Ceph at Ceph.com, uh, and there's a mailing list there, so thanks a lot for your time. Thank Appreciate you very much. It. Thank you. Have a good one. All right.